Hey, you're listening to Radio Free Flint. Uh, today, my guest is Gregory Fournier, a retired professor who lives in one of the greatest weather places in the United States, San Diego, California. Welcome, Greg. Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, this is your second round here with me, and you're the first author that I've invited back twice. So uh, either that says I'm hard up for guests or you're really good. And uh, my audience really liked your uh, your uh, time with us when you talked to us about the Purple Gang, and uh, so I thought I, I thought I'd work on another book that you did, uh, although it's a couple of years ago. Uh, it's a fascinating case. Uh, it's an unsolved murder, the John Norman Collins case, and I'd like to uh, talk to you yeah. about that. You you wrote a book about it. Yeah, Taryn uh, Solani. John Norman Collins unmasked. And the unmasked part is that I don't feel that there was ever a good uh, account of, uh, of who he was and, uh, you know, how he got that way. And, uh, uh, and it, it's actually been pretty well received. The first book that came out, uh, I hate to give a plug for it, but it's called The Michigan Murders. And uh, the guy who wrote that wrote it five years after the fact. Uh, and I wrote my book over 50 years after the fact. So I had the benefit of, of hindsight. But I also had the benefit of being on the campus at the time, understanding the, the campus culture, being in uh, that neighborhood, which was just south of uh, uh, Eastern Michigan University's uh, campus. And, uh, you know, the students called it the student ghetto. And uh, so I knew where he lived then, but I, again, did not know uh, what he was up to. And very few people uh, knew what he was up to. But uh, well, what he was up to is murder. He murdered, as far as I can discern, seven women. And he put many more women, young women, uh, in harm's way. Uh, asking them to get on his motorcycle or get in his car, you know, let's go here and there. Um, and a lot of them just felt, uh, I've spoken to a good many of these ladies, and they just had a kind of a an uneasy feeling about him, you know, a bad vibe. But on the other hand, there were people I've spoken to that did get on the motorcycle. He didn't murder them uh, uh and you know, a lot some would say you know he seemed like a nice guy but he had no trouble getting a date he didn't have to kill these women to have sex with them uh to put it bluntly and uh uh so it it comes down and i'm going to just jump to the chase and, uh, with my opinion and that's all it is uh, is that John Collins was a uh, uh, a control killer. Uh, there's a term for it. I just had it and it slipped out of my mind. Power and control. And I think that appealed to him a lot. And he had many chips on his shoulder, but I think he had a big one here from a domineering mother and he was the third child uh, of a divorce. And, you know, I'm going to uh, venture to say that uh, he was the third child. He was an, the unwanted child. I saw uh, some people think that he gave definition to what was his, the, the term serial killer, which until the 60s, we really never had that in our lexicon in Michigan there anywhere else did no it, they were called multiple murders multiple murderer at the time and it wasn't till a, a, a few years later the golden age of serial killers uh, would be the 1970s through the 1980s and all of the, the big names that we're all so familiar with and they've had book after book and video after video on them uh or, or, John well, Norman Collins well, was was uh, he roamed the streets in the in the late sixties. 
Yes, uh -huh. he was before them. And I dare say that he was the prototype uh, for Ted Bundy. If you, you know, study both of those serial killers, you'll find that Bundy was so much like Collins, psychologically, uh, socially, uh, you know, both were ambitious. Uh, you know, they, there were differences, of course, but how he killed and uh, who he killed, very similar, because they, they always, uh, you know, went for either the college-aged young woman or in Col John Collins's case, he killed two teenagers, a 14-year-old and a, a, a person who was 16, but she had only been 16 for 20 days. He was a he was in a fraternity. I read someplace. He was a Theta Chi, which was the Animal House fraternity on Eastern's campus, and yeah. they were a bunch of jacks who were dedicated to party and hardy. And of course, when the new freshman class comes in, they hold these uh, uh, keggers and so on. And they draw a lot of, you know, young women to these. So there'd be a crowd, three, four hundred people. They'd have to close the street. And uh, and so I think he saw that as uh, as a way to to meet women. This case drew more than a, a little attention in Michigan at the time because I remember when I was a kid, this scared the hell out of a lot of people. Well, this was said, a, and the reason I uh, named the book the way I did, Terror in Ypsilanti, was it? Yeah, um, now you would think that uh, somebody who was, you know, becoming a household name within southeastern Michigan would have been somebody whose dirty deeds, if you will, uh, would have carried him into infamy for a long time, but his fame really was short-lived. And... You know, I have a theory. I believe it's more than a theory on why. And it was because how his case was handled. So Collins was only tried for one of the cases, even though there were other very strong cases. Delby there were six won. other, were there six other victims? There were six other victims. And one of them was from uh, California. So at any rate, uh, two, three of the other uh, Michigan murders, uh, Delhi could have uh, brought a case for them, but he wasn't aware of, you know, how history would, his decision would tend to uh, cloak Collins in some anonymity uh, because he, if he had been a serial killer, other people would have written about him and, you know, he would have been right with the, oh. the rest of, of uh, the, the infamous serial killers. When, you, when, when your book came out in 2016, it sort of stirred up the hornet's nest a little bit and there became some interest in, in the DNA evidence that had been developed. Mm -hmm. and. I think it was the Detroit Free Press, or it might have been you, discovered that at least uh, two samples, DNA samples from two, two of the victims, had never been tested. They, well, had, they uh, had possession of it, but they didn't proceed to do testing for some reason. Uh, Collins, uh, uh, to talk about that first, uh, continually refused to give DNA until it was uh, state law that all prisoners had to, you know, give saliva and or blood samples, whatever.